All right, well, it's great to be back here at Five Stone Students. Uh, it's actually been uh, five weeks uh, since I've preached here, and so uh, if you didn't know, uh, July was a pretty crazy month for me. I spent uh, a week and a half in Africa uh, with our Tanzania mission team, along with Olivia, who didn't give a wave. And so uh, if you didn't hear, it was an incredible experience. Uh, we witnessed our team witness uh, over a thousand salvations amongst the uh, Tanzanians and the villages. I personally witnessed almost 170 first time citizens. Emma was there. Emma was there too. Brad, Emma was there too. Yeah, Emma was there too. Yeah, yeah. And so she was actually leading the, the trip. And so thank you, Donna. Um, and so. Uh, it was just incredible to see what, what God did with our team there, and uh, it was just an incredible experience, definitely. Uh, an experience I'll remember for the rest of my life. And so, uh, and then I was on vacation for a week, and then last week we were at uh, Six Flags Hurricane Harbor in Arlington, so we were here. So uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. It's been a long time. So uh, we're going to start with a question. Uh, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase, free people? Free people. Now, uh, if you think back maybe a month ago to Independence Day, uh, you would think uh, fireworks, patriotic songs, uh, maybe uh, a clothing brand. So let's try that again. Let's try that again. Uh, what comes to your mind when you hear someone has become a free person? That's, that's a better way uh, to <laughs> phrase that. Uh, maybe someone who gets out of jail, uh, now they are free to become another contributing member of society and join the rest of the population. Someone who gets their driver license, well now they're free to drive themselves in a vehicle. Or uh, someone who graduated from high school, <laughs> they've been set free from having to sit in a school for eight hours every day, plus many hours of homework at night. Or uh, someone who turns 18 or 21, well, now they're free to be considered an adult in our culture and start making uh, their own decisions. Those are all really different scenarios, but they all have one thing in common. Freedom. Freedom. Uh, and as we all know, freedom is a very good thing. I don't think anyone would argue with that. We're Americans. Uh, freedom is one of the best and hardest things about middle and high school. Uh, here's what I mean. In middle and high school, you probably, you're probably freer right now than you've ever been before in your life. For instance, you don't have to stay in the same classroom all day like little kids have to do. You don't have someone telling you where to eat lunch. Chances are your parents are letting you go more places and do more stuff without them than you ever have before. At the same time, freedom is one of the hardest things because even though we have more uh, freedom than we've ever had, we still don't have all the freedom that we want. Can I get an amen, high schoolers, to that one? Uh, if you're in middle or high school, chances are you want to be able to make your own decisions. You want to be able to live outside of the restrictions of the authority figures around you. You want to be able to go on a pro trip with your friends and not have to run it by anyone. For you, freedom is a break from the rules. It's saying goodbye to your school's rules, your parents' or step-parents' rules, and your teacher's rules. Freedom makes meaning your own rules, like no more curfew because you're too young to stay out late. No more get a parent signature because you're too young to sign yourself. No more text me where you are because your mom needs to know where you are at every waking moment of your life. And in that way, getting older leads to more freedom because you don't have to live with all of those kind of rules. In other words, freedom is basically the opposite of having something or someone control you. And that sounds good to just about everybody. And that's why some people have a hard time with the idea of God, the church, the Bible. Understandably, when it comes to freedom from control, a lot of people feel the opposite of freedom at church. Maybe you felt that way. 
let's face it, many of us think Christianity is all about rules. You may not have grown up in church, but I sure did. And uh, my understanding of Christianity started probably at an early age with the Ten Commandments. And when I was little, uh, the Ten Commandments seemed like a whole bunch of thou shalt not. My mom did everything she could to make sure I was a rule follower when I was young. And she had good intentions for that. But over time, this began to shape my view of God. I saw Him as a God who was all about what I did and didn't do. Kind of like a scorekeeper in a basketball game. And you can relate. Maybe you've always seen God as a rules person also. Everyone from the church to the preachers, the Bible, seems to back that up. And for some of you, like me, your parents back that up. A lot of people feel the opposite of freedom at church. Things like, thou shalt not drink alcohol. Thou shalt not have sex. Thou shalt not cheat on any school assignment. Thou shalt not say curse words unless you only say the first letter of them. Whisper them. That's okay. Thou shalt pray and read your Bible. Thou shalt Go to church and invite your friends. Thou shalt talk about God in small group and at your school. The problem is that these feel like rules. And for people like you who desperately want freedom, rules can feel like control. I feel like curfew. I feel like dress codes. I feel like do your homework and eat your veggies. Bottom line, none of us like rules. We don't like being told what to do, and we don't like being told what not to do. Even if you're not tempted to drink alcohol or you don't need to cheat on a test, well, uh, probably still don't like being told that you can't do those things. I bet some of you would say that rules seem to set you up for failure because you've tried to follow the rules before, but ultimately failed. Maybe you went to a church service, a camp, a retreat, and you made an important spiritual decision. I'm going to get my act together in this particular area. And you try. You really try. You gave it your best shot. And you held strong for weeks. Maybe even months after that camp or retreat. And then one night, one weekend, you stumbled. felt like a failure because you didn't follow the rules. Go one step further to say that some of you love a lot of things about God, church, and the Bible. It's, it's just those, those rules that make you feel like you have to live a boring, locked-down life with no chance of excitement. And doesn't every other area of your life have rules. Rules at home, rules at school, rules at work if you have a job. So when you come to church and hear about more rules, it's not like, oh man, this is awesome. I can't wait to hear about the things that I can and can't do. Yeah, most people don't say that. But, uh, but here's a question that has always bothered me, and maybe it bothers you too. If God made us, and freedom is something that we all want, 
Doesn't that mean God put that desire inside of us? Doesn't that mean God literally wired us for freedom? And if so, why do we feel the opposite of freedom at church? How does that work? Which is, that's exactly the tension that we're going to talk honestly about throughout this series over the next month. And we're going to kick things off in this new series, Free People, by looking at a book of the Bible called Galatians. Now, the thing about Galatians is it's, it's not actually a book. It was originally a, a letter. It was a letter, uh, and I know that's kind of confusing. It's actually a letter written by a guy named Paul, uh, who was a leader in the early church. Now, if you've never heard of Paul, here's the short version. He was a Christian, hating Jewish leader. Uh, and then, one day, he meets Jesus. But not the way that you meet your best friend at Starbucks. No, it's a different kind of meeting how Paul met Jesus. That's his brother. See, Paul met Jesus after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. So that kind of shook him up a bit and changed Paul's mind about a lot of stuff. And he actually decided to become a Jesus follower himself and became an important church leader. And, and back in the day, as a church leader, uh, you couldn't just DM other church members or, or start like a group chat or text with other church Christian people. Uh, you wrote actual physical letters to each other in the first century. That's how you communicate. And that's what Paul was doing here in the letter of Galatians. That's why he begins his letter this way. Let's check it out. Go ahead and pull it up. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Now that last part at the bottom, to the churches in Galatia, uh, we'll set the context of why that is. Well, the reason it says that is because uh, Paul was writing this to a Christian church in the city of Galatia. The Galatians give you some background and context of uh, Paul's letter here. Um, the Galatians were dealing with a lot, I mean a lot, of tension. Uh, and one of those tensions was this wrestling match between following the rules, like we talked about a few minutes ago, and, on the other hand, giving people grace and forgiveness when they didn't follow the rules. You see, since Jesus was born into ancient Jewish culture, some of these people had grown up hearing about the law, which was basically uh, God's set of rules for the people he cared about. And this law was given to the Jewish people. But then they learned about grace, which meant they could still have a relationship with God based on what Jesus did for them on the cross when he died for them and rose from the dead. Grace allowed people to be connected to God despite failing at the whole rule-following thing. So we can relate to Paul's audience here in those 2,000 years ago. So basically, people were confused that Paul was writing to. They were like, okay, what now? What do we do? Uh, what do we not do? Law or grace? Which is it, Paul? Tell us. So just to give you some context, the law had some weird things in it. Not because God was, was trying to be strange. No, that's not why. It's because the culture in the first century Roman world was just a lot different than our culture today. As in, very different than our culture today. Uh, so different, in fact, that men could actually, um, men could have multiple wives in that culture. Uh, they could sell their own children into slavery if they wanted. Uh, that's the kind of culture uh, that they were dealing with 2,000 years ago. So if someone back then heard rules about how to cut their hair or what clothes they needed to wear and how to prepare their food, 
They weren't things that were designed to be weird just for weirdness sake. They were just things that in the cultural context of the time were best for people based on God's love for them. And right up there in the category of weird religious things came a topic called, I'm just going to say, circumcision. That was the first time in 15 years of youth ministry I've ever said that from a sermon. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go there. And uh, yeah, um, I'll just say it. It's no fun. It was no fun for guys back then. Um, and I've been in youth ministry long enough to know that not only do you feel a little uncomfortable right now, uh, your, your mind is probably racing with some pretty crazy questions right now. Uh, many of you probably already know what that is, but if you don't, our deep group students are going to love this. You can actually deep group sleep with it. I this at the end of the message saying you don't know what that is. Now, circumcision usually happens with babies when they're first born, but uh, what we're going to talk about, the procedure that we're talking about tonight is actually talking about happening to grown men. Strange, yes. Yes. Uh, and to think about it in terms of religious acts in the ancient world that represented someone's true devotion to God Seems straight crazy to us today in modern day 21st century America. 2,000 years ago, people were asking, do the guys have to take this particular step in order to be okay with God? That's what the church in Galatia are asking Paul. Now, some people thought the answer to this is an obvious yes. It's in the Jewish law. If you love God, this happens. So on one side, these are probably the Jewish people that were born Jewish people saying that. On the other side were all these Gentile, non-Jewish Roman citizens who are becoming Christians in Galatia going, ah, my Jewish friends over there that are Christians are telling me that I need to go through this, this serious, heavy surgery if I want to be called a Jesus follower? Are, are we sure about this? Because Paul, I thought you said there's this race thing. We're not under the law anymore. Jewish Christians, the Jewish Christians are like, yeah, you guys need to do this. Gentile Christians over here are like, ah, are you guys sure about this? Uh, is it really necessary? We're talking about surgery for people. It was a cause of some pretty serious conflict in the first century in the church. And so this is the background and context that Paul is writing this letter into. Pretty serious conflict. So now we understand why Paul had to talk about now, in chapter 5 of his letter to the Galatians, Paul writes something very interesting. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, I imagine some people of Paul's first century audience were wondering, is it freedom that set us free? Why, why doesn't he just say that we are set free? Why does he say that it is for freedom we have been set free? Confusing, right? Remember, Paul was writing to a group of people who believed that keeping law was what would make them right with God. They believed that real God followers did certain things. And circumcision was one of those things. With that in mind, Paul basically says, Jesus did what he did so that you could live as free that you're not free. You are. And freedom means that you don't have to do anything to be in God. It was now all about what Jesus did on the cross and no longer about how well we followed the control of rules and laws. This is what Paul's saying. Many of these people couldn't imagine a life where they could walk with God in confidence and peace, whether or not the behavior matched up with everything they're supposed to do. Or not. Notice that Paul didn't say, it's for church attendance that you have been set free. Or it's for good behavior that you have been set free. Or it's for perfection that you have been set free. Or it's for losing your individuality that you have been set free. Or it's for boredom. No! It's all for freedom. 
you were set free to be free. You were set free to live as free people. When it comes to a close relationship that's based in grace, you and I are free to relax. Relax. You should understand that we will all have good days and bad days as Jesus followers. We'll have days when we follow the rules and days when we're off track. We should always know with confidence that God desires to be near you. We were made to walk in freedom. Jesus wants us to be free people. And that's our bottom line tonight. Go ahead and say it to your neighbor. Jesus wants us to be free people. Now, does this mean that we should immediately just ignore all the rules that God has set for us? Huh. And chances are that you don't really even want to. You know that rules like don't lie and don't cheat are actually good for you. And in the coming weeks, we'll talk about the rest of them. But for now, let's focus on what we know for sure. Jesus wants us to be free people. Some of us. That's a massive change. For a few of you, this comes down to your view of walking with God. Because some of you have spent your whole life thinking like this being close to God equals following rules. And on the flip side, not following rules, messing up, means not being close to to God. To be real with you guys, when I was your age, this was my mindset. That I believe that when I was following rules, and I was a pretty good kid, that because I was following the rules, I thought I was a pretty good Christian. But that mindset, what that led to was that those times when I did mess up and when I did fail and fall into sin, I felt like I'd blown it. That I wasn't good enough to be able to go to church. That I wasn't good enough to be able to pray. That I wasn't good enough to be able to worship. And when I'd fail and when I'd fall into sin, that mindset led to a lot of guilt and shame. That was not from God. So this was me. But that's what a lot of teenagers today think. That's their mindset when it comes to God. When you think that way, it feels like your relationship with God is always on the line when you mess up. Which means, when you don't keep the rules, you count yourself out like I did. You don't show up at church. You don't talk and open up in your small group. You stay locked down. It's for freedom you have been set free. So this is not true according to Scripture. This is a lie. No, it's your freedom that you have been set free. That means you're free to be here at Five Stone Students when you sin, when you mess up. You're always free to come here as you are in the midst of your sin. Even though you can't remember the last time you read your Bible, you can't remember the last time you prayed. You are always welcome here at Five Stone Students to come as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up before you come here. It also means this. You are free to pray even when you fail. For a lot of middle schoolers and high schoolers, when they fall into sin, when they fail, they think that sin drives them away from God. And they go, I, I can't pray to God, I'm too dirty. Nothing could be further 
from the truth. The truth is that Jesus is beckoning you to it and saying, come to me, confess your sins so that I can forgive you, so that you can be back in a right relationship with me. But many teenagers believe the lie that, no, I'm too dirty to come to church. I'm too dirty to pray to God. What would he want to hear from a person like me? It's a freedom that you've been set free. It also means that you're free to worship. Catch this, guys. Even when you feel like you don't deserve to. Have you ever come to church on a Wednesday night here at Five Students or on Sunday morning in the worship center? And like, oh man, all I can remember is what I did Saturday night at that party I should have been at. Or I looked at that website last night that I shouldn't have looked at. And you, you find yourself not singing, not worshiping. I don't know if you've ever actually said this to yourself, but maybe the real reason you're not worshiping is that if you're really honest and real with yourself, you're thinking in your mind, because of my sin, because of my failures, I'm not free to worship. No, you are. You are free to worship even when you feel like you don't deserve to. Remember, we talk a lot about this, Scott. Not trusting your feelings, especially with teenagers. Feelings are all up and down. Emotions are all up and down. Don't just rely on your feelings. Rely on the truth of God's word. In other ways, that you're free to be close to God even when you're not being good. When you're not keeping rules, when you're sinning in the midst of sin, you're still free to be close to God. He wants to draw towards you if you'll draw towards Him. You're free to call yourself a Jesus follower. Catch this. Even when you haven't acted like the Jesus follower should. That is what freedom looks like to us. But I wish that when I was in middle school or high school, someone had told me that. Think about it this way. We all know people that we feel like we have to walk on eggshells around. Uh, we can't say the wrong thing or the wrong thing, or they'll blow up and get mad. Anybody know somebody like that? Yeah? Um, a famous author, Christian author named John Maxwell, said it like this, that the weaker person in any relationship will always control that relationship. Uh, meaning that the stronger person is the only one that has any self-control to, to not blow up and to be careful, and it's always the person that's controlled, because the weaker person is the one that can't control themselves, so they control the relationship. And so as the stronger person in the relationship, you have to, you're the one that has to control yourself, because you can't control them. They're controlling the relationship. You're walking in eggshells. They don't care. They'll blow up on anyone. <laughs> so we all know people like this. We have to walk in eggshells. Uh, they keep us on edge. But... The opposite is true as well. We know the people who will love us no matter what. We all know people that we can be real with. We can be ourselves around, not have to worry about being judged. We can even be our worst selves around them. And guess what? Those people are going to love us no matter what. You guys know what I'm talking about now? You got that person in mind? Hopefully you all have at least one person in mind. What do you do when you're around those people? Now, hopefully, if you don't know somebody outside of church, hopefully you know somebody here five six students. Because that's one of our core principles is that you're free to be yourself, to leave your mask at home, to come as you are here at five six students, and not be judged, and to be accepted and loved by God and by us. So hopefully that's somebody in your team. Yeah, like my brothers and my sisters in Christ, yeah, they'll love me no matter what I give them. They know what I'm showing with. Leave your mask at home. You might have to pretend and be somebody different at home or at school. You come here for some students who want you to feel safe and valued and loved to be yourself and to leave your mask at home. Tell people what you're really going through and know that they're not going to judge you. So when you're around those people that you trust, your best friends, what do you do around them? You do this. We said it earlier. Relax. Relax. Easy being around people that will accept you no matter what, that really know you, right? Paul is basically saying that we can relax in our relationship with God. We have nothing to prove because it's already been proven. Jesus did everything that needs to be done for us to be good with God. Let me say that again. Eyes up here. Jesus did everything 
that needed to be done for us to be good with God. It's done. So relax. Don't be stressing about, am I doing this perfectly right, perfectly well? No, we're all going to have good days and bad days spiritually. Now, do our decisions and choices matter? Of course they do. When you guys have kids one day, you'll find out about why your parents want you guys to follow the rules. They want what's best for you. You'll care about your kids one day, your, their decisions and behavior. Because you'll want what's best for them. And that's what God wants for us. We'll talk more about that later in this series. But for now, if you're a follower of Jesus, guys, I right here. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you call yourself a Jesus follower, relax. There's nothing to prove. The work is done. Enjoy your relationship with Jesus. Because that's what free people do. Remember, Jesus wants us to be free from people. It's our bottom line tonight. Go ahead and pull that one up. Jesus wants us to be free. Remember that this week when you start stressing about things. Now, if you've gotten yourself out from your faith for any reason because of something you did or maybe lots of things that you've done, I want to give you a moment to count yourself back in with Jesus because of what He has done. Jesus wants you to know that you're free to come back I want you to know you're free to be here at Five Stone Students. You're free to worship with us freely as Jesus intended you to. No matter what your relationship with Jesus feels like right now, we thought this moment was too important to end without giving you a chance to respond to me. I'm going to invite Grayson back up here on stage. As we close with this song, maybe for you that means raising your hands. Maybe it means actually singing. Or maybe it means texting your small group leader or walking over to them during the last song and saying, I know I've been really close and haven't really been opening up in small groups, but starting tonight, I'm back in. No matter what that looks like, you remember, if your faith is in Jesus, you're in. Jesus wants you to live in that. So we have uh, one more song. If y'all want to stand up, uh, we're going to sing uh, a song that's really been impacting my life um, in the past couple of months. It's very sad. Yeah. Um, it, it just directly correlates to what we've been talking about tonight. Yeah like where our identity is in Christ um, and who we are um, in God's eyes. Um, and and we're, we're free. Um, we don't have to conform to the standards of the world anymore. We don't have to, to chase success and chase um, accomplishments. Um, because, right, like God, God's already done that for us. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, so yeah, this song just, just encompasses that idea um, that we're free. Um, we don't have to, to prove ourselves to God. We don't have to prove ourselves to the world.